taken outside of ISTB4. So after this meeting here, we can just move on over there, get our picture taken, and then have a great time afterwards. Now, welcome everybody to ASU and Space Vision 2013. <clears throat> Today, it is my pleasure to introduce to you a man who is currently the VP of North American Operations of ISU, the International Space University, an organization whose mission it is to develop the future leaders of space. Prior to that, he was, or prior to ISU, he held numerous positions with NASA, including uh, contributing to their strategic planning and uh, <coughs> uh, the holding a bachelor's degree in physics from Drexel and a master's degree in aeronautics and astronautics from MIT. He's currently a board member of the American Aeronautics Society. And oddly enough, he was actually a member of the Space Habitat Study Group, which was a precursor to SEDS way back in the day. This gentleman here is Mr. Steve Brody. Thank you so much. No, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, oh, let's see. I don't need both of these, right? You take that. How's the volume? Okay? Okay, good. So uh, it's been great to be with you uh, the last day or so. I came in from, I live in Arlington, Virginia. I came in from D.C. on Friday and, uh, and my first time here at ASU. So I appreciate uh, the hosting of our local university. Um, let me just say a word or two that wasn't mentioned, uh, just because I know many of you are uh, perhaps, you know, some of you are seniors, Many of you are thinking about what lies ahead and all that. I have a son who's a senior in college right now, and I'm uh, actively involved in, in uh, hearing from him as well about his plans. Um, I've been in industry and in government in academia uh, throughout my career. Uh, space has been my passion. As my dad said growing up, I took up space, and I just kept on doing it as I, as I got old, older in life. And, um, my one piece of advice would be, don't worry so much about, did I pick the right thing to do next? Because there will be so many different opportunities throughout a long career to dive into this or that or the other. So if you have sort of a shopping list you're trying to select from, do I go on to graduate school? Do I take a job? Do I go to a foundation? Do I go on to, you know, do I form my own company? See what's right. What feels right, go for it, and just know that there will be other things that you'll have to do. I spent eight years in industry out of, out of an undergraduate, or out of my graduate school training working on the space shuttle, helped uh, develop the space shuttle, and then joined NASA to work on space station and international cooperation. I had an overseas position four years for NASA, being a liaison, which was sort of a political job, but a programmatic, technical, uh, scientific kind of position came back and worked 10 years on space science, helped to develop the deep impact uh, comet impactor mission as well as uh, lunar prospector, uh, Genesis, and the Sophia Observatory and a few others, and then did some strategic planning and all that. So that's just a nutshell. You know, here we're, I did an engineering job at one time, I did some more pure science work, did some more things that were related to international collaboration, uh, and I hope that you will also, if you are so inclined, to have a diversity in your career, to feel like there's no bad choices. Just go for it if you have a passion for it and, um, and have fun at it. So that's my little sales pitch. <laughs> so I'm here mainly to give you a little introduction. I, ISU was at, uh, uh, the little gem that I found after my NASA career. You know, I wanted to work in education after spending uh, 20 years at NASA. Uh, and for, I, for me to come to ISU was a, was a real dream. It's an it's a institution, if you don't already know, that was founded by the same three founders that founded SEDS. Um, let's see. So, and there's a good picture up in the upper right of those three founders who founded SEDS, Space Gen, which is for young professionals in the space field, as well as ISU. Todd Hawley, who unfortunately is no longer with us, Bob Richards, who will be the keynoter tonight at uh, the banquet, and Peter Diamandis, many of whom know, you know as uh, founder of the XPRIZE and other, uh, other organizations. And I'd like to say what attracted me personally to ISU as what do I want to do next after having been at NASA and, and done other things, were some of the words that I found in a credo that were written by these three visionaries 
uh, a place that it recognizes the importance of interdisciplinary, inter interdisciplinary studies and not just engineering interdisciplinary. We're talking about everything from rocket science to the humanities to arts and space to policies, UN treaties, business case for making a profit. You know, so everything from economics to engineering and everything that, that falls in between is what ISU embraces and what the founders viewed for said. So I really do embrace and, and, um, uh, and, and applaud those chapters that have truly achieved in, uh, the, 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 dis, the diversity of disciplines uh, and majors that are in many of the clubs that I've, I've come in contact with. And then the, the second bullet there, uh, where the diversity of culture, philosophy, lifestyle, training, and opinion are honored and nurtured. Uh, those are, that's the credo of the university. So it's a place where anyone of any background, from any country, from Andorra to Zimbabwe, uh, can, can come and learn and be passionate about space, whether it is your, your idea to go and explore beyond low Earth, or, low, low Earth orbit, or to use what we know and can observe from space to help sustain our planet and live in a more um, pleasurable and sustainable environment. Um, I should also mention uh, just that uh, for those of you that know of the famous 2001 A Space Odyssey film that was a, a major uh, uh, impact for, for many people in the uh, 60s growing up, that the first chancellor of ISU was uh, Sir Arthur C. Clarke, who's now gone to the great beyond. So uh, what is ISU? And I'll have a picture of the, of the building. The building itself and our campus uh, which was established 10 years after the founding of ISU uh, is in Strasbourg, France, so I'll have a picture of that. Uh, but ISU basically is a graduate school. We do not do any undergraduate training. A graduate school where the mission is to develop the future leaders of the world space community by providing interdisciplinary programs for students and space professionals. In, and this is the, the key mantra of the university is the three I's, inter, interdisciplinary, international, intercultural environment. Um, good, you can probably read some of these names. Here's just a sampling. One of, the, one of the brilliant ideas of the founders and how it's manifested itself is not to have a standing large faculty. In Strasbourg, France, at the central campus, we have eight eight or nine resident faculty members, but they're like department heads and organizers. The faculty of ISU is about 65 strong, and these are some of the people, they have day jobs around the globe. They are ex-astronauts, uh, rocket scientists, space lawyers, economists, business owners, who are throughout the globe who will come to the campus for a week or a month or longer, or come to our summer program that moves from campus to campus, from country to country each summer, and spend time teaching. Many of them, some of them are alumni of the university itself. Others are very prominent. Uh, for example, while well, Jeff Hoffman, he, uh, he helped um, repair the space, the, the Hubble telescope on one of his four or five space missions for NASA, who's now an MIT professor. John Logsdon, who has wrote the book on the Kennedy decision to go to the moon. He was a Space Policy Institute director at George Washington and has been on the transition teams for the last couple de Democratic presidents on how to, how to run the space program. So you have those kind of people. And then Robert Thirsk, a Canadian astronaut, uh, he's actually taught a course from space to our students where they proposed him to do some vestibular um, uh, biomedical things while he was on the station and he did a video conference with our students and uh, individuals from around the globe. Um, the ISU community and what we call the community is the alumni as well as the faculty members, the people that have been close to the university. It's now since uh, the founding in 87, over 3,700 alumni from over 100 countries. Everything in red is where we have alumni uh, we're still trying to fill in a few areas of the globe, but uh, you can't pretty much throw a stone at a space activity anywhere in the globe without hitting an ISU alum. They're just, or, and, and potentially you may be hitting uh, somebody that's founded a company uh, or is in significant roles. For example, uh, 
I don't know if, if Will's in the office, but Will Pomerantz from, yeah, he's back there, uh, Virgin Galactic, he's an alum. And feel free to ask Will, or any, is, is there any other alumni or faculty or lecturers from ISU in the room? I don't think so. Thanks, Will, for being the representative alum here. Feel free to ask him about his personal experience there. 83% uh, are, are active in the space sector. So principally, those that come to ISU really want I, um, space to be their careers and, and have lived that out. Some come just because they want to have the summer experience, which I, I liken to a space camp on steroids. It's an incredible nine-week experience. We have people come that are everything from in their 20s to we've had uh, people come in their 50s and 60s that have always loved space but maybe have followed a different career path and want to give up uh, a summer to spend a nine-week intensive period together. Uh, one thing to note is that the diversity of the alumni, the population right now, um, let's see, from the, the states, we have the largest alumni population, but it's only about 500 of that 3,700. So that gives you a sense. That's the, the single country with the largest alums is the US at 500. But it, given that the number is 3,700, we are really truly global. Canada is second, they're about 450. China's coming up fast. They generally send about 20 a year to ISU. Uh, India, you all throughout Europe, Asia, and elsewhere um, send people to train at ISU. The last, um, let's see, I'll go on. So here's, again, a little, little bit more of an eye chart, mainly just to illustrate, again, what I just said. We have alums all over the world and many of them now in fairly senior positions. Uh, Jessica Meyer was just selected in the latest astronaut class. She was a professor at Harvard Medical School. Uh, she's an alum. Uh, let's see, Su Yong Yi, South Korea's first astronaut. She came to ISU after her flight and was in the summer program, the nine week summer program. Uh, Francis Suzera is the assistant director of the Nigerian Space Agency helped to form a space agency in Nigeria. Um, let's see, who else I can point out? Well, Chris Salaberger, who's now the chairman of the board of the Board of Trustees, an alum of the university, former vice president for MDA. Uh, Tabor McCallum is a prominent name in this field. He's a CEO of Paragon. It's probably the first company birthed by ISU, uh, Tabor, and, and uh, a couple of his colleagues were, were students in ISU's first or second uh, class back in the 80s. They formed Paragon. He's also the chief technology office, uh, officer for Worldview Corporation that was just announced uh, recently to, to fly uh, the stratospheric balloon experience. And he's also involved with Dennis Tito on this Inspiration Mars, the uh, trip around Mars 501 days. So these are all different alums. You've got a bunch of NASA folks and others. Um, so it's a great network, people that are really doing things in space, making it happen, and become your classmates, so to speak, through the alumni network. So uh, again, I've already mentioned this three eyes, interdisciplinary, international, intercultural, truly embracing the fact that it's from different points of view, from different life experiences, that innovation, new ideas, new capabilities come about. And when you put yourself in an environment where you bring your talents, your background, into a team that is as diverse as uh, you, one, one team we had in our master's program had a UK helicopter pilot in it, a medical doctor from Kenya, a lawyer from Japan, an architect from the States, plus engineers and scientists of all different levels of of, of experience, and that was a master's class at ISU. And that's not atypical to have that kind of mixture of talent and experience. Uh, and then some well, boilerplate thing, but it's great for uh, you know getting a competitive edge, uh, becoming a member of this network. That and I see throughout the blogs and the and the um, the social networks amongst the alums. Uh, people like Virgin Galactic and others will let let the word go out. We have jobs available. We're looking for people. We know of the ISU experience and would welcome their alums putting their their uh, 
um, their applications in for jobs. And we have those kind of emails that go out through the system. I'm starting a company. I'm going to be in Africa and South Africa looking for fellow alums that have this kind of talent. The major, so the major programs, I mentioned this is at Space Camp on Steroids, as I mentioned. It's a nine-week summer program. It was the very first. It's the flagship program. When, when ISU was founded on MIT's campus for the first approximately 10 years of the university, we had no permanent campus. What we did is every summer, we went to a different university around the globe that would host our nine-week program. Uh, in the 90s, the campus in Strasbourg, France, was selected by competitive procurement. 11 cities from around the globe uh, put in proposals to host ISU, and Strasbourg gave uh, the university's founders an offer they couldn't refuse. A uh, beautiful building and land in the Alsace region, not a bad place to go if you like wine or cheese or uh, the Rhine River or different cultures. Strasbourg means a city of crossroads, and, and as, as so those students of history know, the Alsace region was German, was French, bounced back and forth, so there's a lot of intercultural aspects of that, that location. We also have run an executive MBA tr tra uh, designed for professionals that have, that are in full-time jobs, cannot leave their work for more than one or two weeks at a time to be in a class environment. Spread out over an 18 month period, you do a one or two week residency every few months, but most of it is distance learning. And one, we have a number of, of smaller programs. One that I have actually on the table in the other hall, I still have some materials about all these programs. Uh, you, and I'll leave it up uh, after we break up here, so if anybody wanted to stop by. The executive space course is this one week space immersion. It's primarily for professionals or individuals in a space field that whose background is not really space. For example, we had a vice president of a satellite company, a vice president of finance for a satellite company that came to that because he wanted to understand what were the engineers talking about when they talked about apogees and perigees, and what were the lawyers talking about when they talked about space liability convention of the UN. So we have people that come to that course. You get a one-week immersion in space everything soup to nuts from uh, rocket science to economics and law. Uh, and all of these include these, uh, the two main programs, I should say, the Masters of Space Studies and the Space Studies and the Summer Program uh, include research team projects, topical things that, that people around the globe are really interested in and will, will sponsor. We get NASA sponsorship, Boeing is sponsored, Lockheed, uh, the World Bank, uh, the UN and others have sponsored team projects on subject areas they're interested in where they want a team of people that can look across nationalities, look across disciplines, and take a, take a hack at coming up with some solutions. This is where that summer program has been since the first one in 1988 at MIT. Uh, the, the, the chart here shows up to 2008. And then here's where we've been in the last several years. Next summer, it'll be in Montreal, Canada, hosted by ETS, a technical university, and HEC, a business college up in Montreal. And in 2015, we've selected Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. That will be the host. Right now, the competition is underway for 2016. Uh, it will definitely not be in the US or in Canada because we move to a different country uh, every year. We, don't, we try to move it around. This is a, a typical cross-section of one of those summer programs. This is from uh, uh, 2010, or yeah, from 2010. There were 121 participants from 29 countries. A quarter were women. 15% uh, had PhDs, but as you see back here, I think this is the bachelor's, and or I can't quite read that. One of these says bachelor's, one says master's. Uh, there's the PhD and there's this other postdoc, which could be medical degree, um, um, law degree, military degrees. Average age, 32. The sweet spot for many of our programs is sort of mid-20s to mid-30s, because many people come either with an advanced degree or with, uh, or with um, work experience. Uh, but as you see here also, there's, let's see, 84%, this part of the pie, uh, had some work experience. But about a, you know, a quarter or so 
come right out of an undergraduate school, so we do fully embrace people coming directly from a bachelor's degree as well. And this is, uh, probably can't read all these, but this is the engineering slice, all different engineering. This is a typical spread of disciplines, all different engineering. There's life sciences, physical, physical sciences, policy and law, business and management, humanities, all the different fields. Uh, so whatever your background is, if the question is, is an ISU a place for me? If you're interested in space, the answer is yes, emphatically. Uh, this is a typical, uh, the last year's master's class. There were 57 participants for 26 countries. You see the age range, the um, typical, so the average is 28, but it went from 28 to 40, 44. Again, about a, let's see, about a third coming uh, either directly from an undergraduate degree or with no professional experience, two thirds with some. So you have that, you have that fresh ideas, uh, experienced ideas, bouncing off of each other, intergenerational interactions as well as interdisciplinary and all different uh, academic backgrounds. Uh, team projects are across the board. Everything from looking at the commercial space transport market, uh, how space technologies could help with natural disasters, how you could use caves on Mars as habitat, potential habitats to give you some isolation from radiation, because uh, we have found that there are caves on Mars, uh, looking at you know, threats to spacecraft, both commercial and military and civilian, solar maximum worries, things about asteroid mining. Uh, we had one that uh, combat legal, illegal fishing. It turns out some of our master students found a way to correlate the motion of trawlers who are doing the illegal unlawful fishing for bluefin tuna and other uh, endangered species in the oceans and through space technology, they were able to formulate both some correlations, some algorithms. Uh, that work was uh, considered so important. NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, asked me to bring in a couple alums, gave a presentation there. We had people from the State Department, U.S. Navy, Coast Guard, the Pew Trust, NASA, and others uh, listening to those presentations. So as it says here, these kinds of um, all these reports almost always go to the International Astronautical Congress, which is a main event in a different international location each year, and the results are briefed on a regular basis. So you get exposure in, in promoting and advertising the work of these team projects. ISU's got essentially both board members, board of trustees members, sponsors, supporters, partners throughout the space industry, throughout the globe, and I won't mention any of these other than just note that um, uh, you probably can't find an organization that isn't in, interacted with NAS, uh, with ISU at some point. Let's see. That's the uh, central campus in Strasbourg, France. Sort of like uh, it, 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 I, it reminds me of the Air and Space Museum in, in the U.S. in terms of its architecture. We have a high bay where we've on occasion, had us, we've had the uh, Excalibur Almaz um, uh, capsule, which was used by the Russians for photo reconnaissance uh, during the Soviet Union days and has been converted as a potential platform for taking humans into space. And uh, they had it into our high bay. So we have a high bay area uh, with lab space. Uh, we have a, a satellite tracking station that's, that's uh, state of the art. Uh, radio telescope that astronomers in Europe occasionally sign up for time on, uh, a concurrent design facility that uh, the European Space Agency uh, donated when they upgraded to their next generation version. And the vision of the founders was sort of three stages. We would have this movement of a summer program without a campus uh, for a number of years, and we'd have a permanent campus. but. ISU is still growing, and eventually we do expect uh, that we will have educational activities, maybe not quite like that, but on the moon, uh, wherever humans go to uh, live, work, learn, and play, ISU expects to be a part of that education. Uh, we have already, we have one of the claims to fame is we've conferred the first honorary doctorate in space, which was given to Anusha Ansari, 
Uh, her last name might be known as the Ansari X Prize that was won by Bert Rutan. Uh, she is the uh, Iranian-born uh, American who paid her way to go up with the Russians onto the space station. And uh, while she was in space, ISU conferred upon her the honorary doctorate from ISU for space achievement. So uh, that's one first that ISU scored. And um, that's, a, that's a last takeaway slide. I'll leave that up there. I think that's, that's all I have on the presentation about ISU. I'm going to be around through the banquet tonight. Uh, I have a little table over there. Happy to take questions. But I didn't want to leave uh, the group in suspense any longer. I have two awards to, to announce. And this is something that grew out of uh, some brainstorming I did a number of years ago and for the last several Space Vision any of you that have been to Space Vision for a few years may know that uh, in co cooperation with women in aerospace, uh, ISU gives a 250 cash prize and an award to the ch a chapter embracing the diversity of gender uh, fully. And, we, and in partnership with the American Astronautical Society, ISU gives a, also a, a $250 prize to a chapter that has embraced uh, majors diversity, essentially multidisciplinary involvement. So everything from uh, you know, uh, aerospace engineering to economics. It's, so I normally would like to have somebody from one of those organizations with me to do this presentation. But you'll just have to live with me doing it alone. And uh, what will accompany the award is uh, at a later date when I get the proper mailing address and how to make out the check. Uh, $250 to the winning chapters and a nice certificate, quote unquote, suitable for framing. So I may at this time announce that, well, I want to get my iPhone out because I made notes to make sure I said this right and didn't name the wrong chapter. Okay, so for the ISU Women in Aerospace Award, uh, Embracing and, re and acknowledging the participation of, of women, which are still underrepresented, uh, not so much at ISU or in, uh, in SEDS as much, but, but certainly uh, in the larger aerospace population. Uh, we are awarding that to UCLA. Do we have any members from UCLA with us today? No, well, we'll have to carry that forward. Uh, Just wanted to note, uh, for great, they had a, a great um, growth spurt this last year, both in the size of the chapter as well as in uh, their uh, reaching essentially parity. Uh, their number was around 50% uh, male-female relationship. And but I did want to give a special shout out to UNC, University of North Carolina. They're very close, very close uh, second, also reaching parity in that category, if not exceeding it. And also to a, a, one of the newest SEDS chapters, Colby College. Anybody from Colby here? From Maine? Pretty far to come. Um, we'll have to also give them a personal shout out. And we'll be looking uh, at both of those schools to see how they maintain their numbers in the future. Uh, and uh, then for the multidisciplinary award, uh, this is the award given with the American Astronautical Society. Not, not to be confused with the American Astronomical Society. They're both AAS, and um, they are easily confused. But the American Astronautical Society, which is a professional society which does embrace all aspects of space, from the policy and economics of it to the technical, and is a great uh, organization to, uh, to help professional growth uh, later on in your careers. So AAS and ISU are awarding to the Dakota Space Society. Anyone from Dakota? No? Nope. OK. <laughs> <laughs> and a major shout out to oh, uh, Arizona State University. Anybody from Arizona State University here? <laughs> <laughs> The, the, it was a razor thin margin, and Dakota just beat you out ver by very, very a slight margin. And uh, I just want to say a, a well done job. Um, 
both, uh, both of those universities as well as many others. The numbers are, are getting uh, excellent in terms of how well, uh, and I've, I've seen it as well in talking to a lot of, of, of you uh, while I've been here, how well other majors, other professional areas of interest from design, from communications, from economics, from business, people do see the connection and see the value and the interest and the potential of careers in and passion for space. So that's great. Um, I think I'm done, uh, except for I did want to make a comment. And this is, I'm going to use a little person, the fact that I've got the microphone. How many were in Phil Platt's keynote yesterday, which I know I very much enjoyed, and, and I'm sure you all did. He made, and I, I just wanted to give you a perspective of somebody that had spent 20 years of my life at NASA um, and also worked on the shuttle and station and other programs. He made a comment that was sort of an offhand remark during a Q&A period, uh, which I took exception to, and he's not here to defend himself, so I'm not going to, so, uh, so I, I welcome I, I, having a beer with him and talking about it. But he made a comment about the space, the space station and the space shuttle. And I, I wasn't involved in either policy decisions or management decisions. Uh, I was basically an engineer on the space station, or the space shuttle, and I was involved with international cooperation on the space, space station. And he made a comment about, well, we built the shuttle, but we didn't have a place to go for it to go to. And we built a station, but we didn't have any way to get it. You know, it was like these things sort of popped out of the air. And many people without a historical perspective and without getting to talk to uh, some of the people like John Logsdon, who are on our faculty, uh, Pete Warden, the head of NASA Ames, is a faculty member, and others, uh, don't have a, a long enough perspective. But from my point of view, from having been uh, a part of the institution of, of NASA for many years from having worked in industry, dreaming about going to work for NASA sometimes, there's, there was quite a lot of debate and thought about why we would have which programs when. Uh, it turns out one of my uh, mentors, a professor at MIT while I was doing my graduate studies there, had been a part of the uh, President Eisenhower, President Kennedy small circle of folks with Werner von Braun and others debating how do we go to the moon and what should be the next steps in, in, NASA, in the country's investments. And many argued for a very progressive, a very um, logical progression from building a rocket, building in, in space orbital infrastructures, that is space stations, and then going from that permanent presence in space to building infrastructure that would take us by a trans space transportation to the moon, landing on the moon, and having that as, quote unquote, the Apollo program. That was overruled for political reasons, because we were in a race with the Russians, you know, the Soviet Union, I should say, and it was uh, done by politics to do the one shot kind of thing, which led to the end of the Apollo era with nothing really left behind, except we did have Skylab, for those that may recall that that was the first laboratory in space. It didn't stay up there because we couldn't get the shuttle developed early enough to go up and boost it up. But then when the shuttle, when they were debating what do we do beyond Apollo, there were again very thoughtful discussions. Well, what should we build? We should build a reusable, fully re what was supposed to be and originally conceived as a fully reusable vehicle. That would be this taxi to space. We would then, we would in parallel develop a space station, which would be that coupling that would lead to research as well as a staging base for going back to the moon and for doing uh, in orbit servicing to build uh, uh, vehicles to take, to go beyond, beyond Earth orbit. And then political realities and budgets set in. And, uh, you know, I don't know if it was a flip of a coin or a, a presidential decision by. Uh, the President Nixon administration and later on, but it was said, well, you're not going to be able to do both. There's not the money to build a space station and a space shuttle. Uh, what do you want to do first? So the decision was made, let's do the shuttle. And then the idea was it would be fully reusable. And the early designs had a fully reusable system with a single stage, first stage, flyback manned booster that would land like, spa like uh, you know, uh, uh, White Knight 2, like the uh, Virgin Galactic idea, you, where you carry uh, the orbiter up. 
And then by, because of budgetary reasons and other reasons, the, ver the version of the shuttle that we developed um, had to make compromises. And space station came later on. And the first vision of space station was this platform not only to do microgravity research, but would have bays for, for uh, building and launching vehicles that would go to Mars and beyond. It would be a, basically a depot in addition to everything that we now talk about station. So before I, I, I say that solely to say that it's important to be a student of history, to read and talk to people that understand some of these decisions uh, before one is quick to disparage or say, what were people thinking? They, they, did they not have a clue that, uh, that this didn't make sense? So, uh, and I'm happy to talk over a glass of wine or whatever at the banquet on any of this stuff. So with that, thank you for your attention. I applaud everything that SEDS is doing at national level. I hope you appreciate that you have some very passionate people helping to lead this organization and doing great things for it. And I'm just very pleased you're all here. And I'm done. Thank you, Steve Brody. Now, we will have time for some questions. So does anybody have a question? All right. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah. On? Oh, yeah, I guess it is on. Um, I was wondering, since you're based out of Europe, have you heard anything about their mission called JUICE? Um, I'm personally based out of Arlington, Virginia, uh, but ISU, certainly, that's where everyone else is. And no, I haven't heard of JUICE. You want to give me a 30-second description for me and the others? <laughs> uh, Jupiter, uh, Jupiter icy moon. Oh, oh, the, the, juicy, the Jupiter icy moon uh, explorer. Um, I have heard of it by that name. I was, I was the program executive at NASA on the Discovery program and the, the um, uh, parallel program, the uh, um, um, Horizon, the, well, the, the mission that's going to Pluto is a part of, the, of a companion line and uh, there was a Jupiter mission in there and I think the icy moons is one of those line items. So I, I'm familiar with it, I don't know exactly where it is in its formulation and or embrace. Other questions? Go ahead. Uh, how much better is how competitive is it to go into ISU? Uh, how competitive is it to get into ISU? It's competitive. I wouldn't say it's, you, you know, I, I, I'd say about, we probably get three, maybe three or four times the number of applicants as the spots we have. Um, so it's not as competitive as you know the the highest level of universities in the states, but typically, um, you know the the fundamental things when people ask me, it's it's not since it's an international university, we don't have we don't go by SAT scores, we don't go by GREs, that sort of thing. We go by academics, uh, fundamentals, passion is important for space, and openness for for other people's ideas. Uh, if, you've, if you've had some experience where you've traveled or you've lived somewhere else or you've learned another language or you've studied a field beyond just your own field, uh, that gives you quote unquote points in the minds of, of the reviewers. Uh, and it's very important to ISU that we have a diversity of opinion, of, of cultural backgrounds, of nationalities, so that all comes into the mix. And, uh, um, so I, I'd say if you're interested at all, you go for it. And uh, even if, it, and you have uh, the, the opportunity to pick a destination. If you want to do the nine week summer program, pick the one that most speaks to you. So. Try again. I've looked into the uh, ISU degree as a sophomore senior at my college. Mm -hmm. and
of degree plans at ISU? Um, we've, we've had somewhat of a debate. One, one thing we're, we're not doing, and it's not really our niche, is to take the place of the place you want to go to be the expert in any special field. If you want to be the best propulsion expert, you go to whatever school will do that for you at the master's or PhD level. Um, same for, you know, if you want to be the best manager of a new company, and you want to get an MBA somewhere, um, you do a fundamental somewhere else. That's why it's so interesting to me to see people come to ISU whose backgrounds include sometimes PhDs or, or professional degrees in other fields. It's that, it's that broadening of perspective that ISU embraces. And in, in it's recognizing that if you're going to be a leader, and it doesn't necessarily mean a, a leader meaning a CEO or the president of NASA, it just means someone whose voice is really respected and listened to in terms of this is, this is what we should do and here's why we should do it. And maybe it's got a little bit of policy in it and maybe it's got a little bit of, you know, I know what the money situation is like as well as you can't snow me on the engineering because I got to, that's, really what we're trying to grow, so to speak, in, in those that come through. Um, so I, it, does that give you a sense of it? Yeah. Do we have any more, que do we have any more questions? Again, I'll be, uh, I'm going to go back over to the table that's in the other building uh, before I pack everything up. I'm going to wait at least 20, 30 minutes or so, maybe not quite that long. Uh, so if anybody wants to come by to pick up any more material or have a conversation there, and I look forward to uh, enjoying uh, uh, the banquet with those of you that will be able to do that this evening. So, again, thanks for your attention. Just a reminder that there is the uh, photograph being taken over at ISTB4 right after this. So if we can just head on over there and get that picture taken, we'd appreciate it.